Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, Distinguished Webinar Series in AI and Cybersecurity. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Kaushik Hattie, and his title yes. is actually um, What, Why, and How Harnessing Knowledge Graphs for Cybersecurity. The, um, Dr. Uh, Kati's experience as follows, you know, data-driven innovation excites him and in, in his 15 years of experience, he has transformed diverse data into powerful solution. He has established and led data science divisions, both in academia and industry. He has also significantly contributed to the development of US, UK government funded scientific software with the nearly 75K global users featured on peer reviewed journals cover pages. Recently, you know, he switched fields to tackle cybersecurity with knowledge graphs, and he's passionate about learning and teaching and collaborating. And uh, uh, Dr. Kaushik is the chief data scientist at Pinnacle.ai company. And with this, you know, um, the floor is yours, Dr. Kaushik. Thank you for uh, uh, taking your time and, and sharing your insight on this topic. Thank you very much, Prakash. I'm able to share my screen now going about it. I hope you are able to see my screen now. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as the title says, I will be delving with the what, why, and how of the knowledge graphs. I have two screens, so I might be shifting my view from here to there, uh, just to let you know. So I want this to be very engaging. I request you to keep your mobiles next to you and hopefully you know, try to scan this. Uh, and I'll be asking some live polls to take your feedback uh, on, on the, uh, as we are discussing this, so that you know, I get to know whom I'm speaking to. And the intention of today's talk is to mostly to share the idea and the concepts than the technology behind it. Uh, I feel it's most important to understand the idea more than the technology. I mean, technology is obviously important, but that comes only later once you have understood or have a clear grasp of the idea. So I'll be mostly emphasizing more on the idea side than the technology, though I will use the technology for, for the demo purpose. And uh, whatever I'm sharing today is not confidential and it's open source. I'm a big fan of open source projects. I've been involved in several large open source projects and I've contributed to it. And I know I continue to you know, uh, uh, give my time as much as possible for open source projects to this day. And your feedback is very important, just like uh, you know, reinforcement learning of algorithms. You know, I, I build on feedback and at the very end, uh, I will uh, provide another QR code for which uh, you should be able to provide the feedback for uh, online. Going forward, I'll just start with uh, you know, one, one example. Uh, are you able to, uh, give a uh, live poll. I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I see that. Thank you. Just to, you know, just to understand, for me to understand if this is working or not. Obviously, uh, if I were to put it, my uh, morning drink is always three. Probably, I mean, morning, afternoon, and evening. I'm a, I'm a tea addict. I've also put that uh, code here you know, in case if somebody comes later uh, during the talk. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's working now. I'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is probably more important. So as I said, I, I really want to understand whom I'm speaking to. You know, virtual uh, things make it slightly difficult some, sometimes. So, so I want to ensure I understand my audience pretty well as far as, as, you know, as, far as possible. So this is another uh, uh, poll. I want to know where you are coming from. So are you coming from a very strong cybersecurity background, specifically on the red teaming side of it? Or uh, is it you know, uh, on the blue side of you know uh, defender side of it? Again, when I say red team, not I'm, I'm not uh, using it in a very strict sense, but anything to do with ethical hacking and you know pen testing, uh, VA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you know if it is business management side, you know project managers, uh, et cetera, uh, or even students who are not necessarily yet in the the field of uh, cybersecurity, but just you know interested to know, it could be also something else. So I, I also see there are people who are uh, of, of you know varied categories, so I will try to keep it uh, uh, as much accessible to all the people whom I'm speaking to on this day. Moving forward, so I will start with what what knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs basically means connected things. You know that's the most simplistic way of you know, describing knowledge graphs. 
So this is, however, the textbook definition. Uh, this is one of the textbooks that I refer to, and it's one of the, you know, I really like this book. You can read this, obviously, you know, uh, a knowledge drive is a model of blah, 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 blah. I'll just you know, I'll let you read it. But the essence is in the next slide. So it's the same definition, but it's, it's all about a knowledge graph is a model of knowledge domain, which is basically a data with context created by subject matter experts who provides context, blah, 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 and then enables the creation of smart multilateral relations throughout your databases, which basically means more data uh, probably inferred with context. So it's basically data with context. That's, that's, you know, that's the you know, uh, essence of uh, this definition, according to me. Of course, there's machine learning uh, algorithms and et cetera. For, this, for today's talk, I am not introducing or discussing anything to do with machine learning, okay? So, you know, I, I will just, whatever I'm saying is pure rule-based, uh, you know, concepts. Uh, there is no machine learning involved as yet. So I will start with this, you know, seven layers of cybersecurity. Probably some people will be, you know, familiar with this. So usually any organization will have these seven layers of cybersecurity, you know, can be categorized into human perimeter, et cetera, et cetera, until uh, mission critical assets. All of this will have some activity. They will have some data. There'll be some logs, some monitoring and more, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. So how do we capture all this data and make sense of this is the challenge. So from all the seven layers of data, we have different kinds of types of data. Like, you know, is it structured or unstructured? Is it quantitative or qualitative? Is it discrete, continuous, time series, so on and so forth. So there is, there is a, a gamut of options and possibilities that is coming out of all these seven layers and probably more. So from here, all this data can be represented either mostly as you know, uh, relational databases, like typical SQL databases, or you know, key value uh, data, or JSON tree. You know, I'm just you know, taking some common examples. Of course, I have not touched, for example, unstructured data. So then how do you go from this kind of data to this kind of data? So that's, that's the you know, key uh, message uh, of, of what is knowledge graph from going from here, uh, where data is everything is fragmented to things where everything is connected to something else. In reality, this is how it, you know, the, 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 the real world exists. Everything is you know, connected to something else and they are not fragmented as the way I have represented here uh, uh, schematically. So this is just the what part of it, the, the most uh, simple form. Then why, you know, why do we need knowledge graph? So in today's world, there is no dearth of data as such. You know, usually we have actually more data than we need. So how do we go from data rich to insights rich? That is where knowledge graphs can help and that is why we need knowledge graphs. So I will start you know, emphasizing this uh, with an example, I'll just take, you know, uh, this is a word play, you know, uh, just uh, keep your mobiles close by, but I'll, I'll just introduce you to this game rather. So let us assume you fall into one of these categories, either cybersecurity expert, a business leader, or a business management professional, or a lay person. So if, if you see elephant, you have to imagine immediately, and you have to you know, think about it as to what, what exactly you imagine when I, you know, when you see elephant. And I'm assuming, you know, all of us agree that you know we we agree that you know, we all imagine this you know, irrespective of whether you, know, you are one of these three. But when you see virus, port, sandbox, and many more, what do you imagine? That's a difficult question. Again, depending on where you are coming from, because even though this is all data, you no, know, ultimately this is all words. Words are facts, and you know, they are data as well. But even for these sim simple, rather simple, single words, it can completely mean different things depending on where you are coming from and depending on the domain that you are most familiar with. So this is, uh, uh, you can keep your mobiles close by. Please let me know by clicking on the image that you will see on your mobile phones as to where you are most close to with respect to say more virus. This is my imagination of what a cybersecurity expert might think when, when he sees the word virus, like is it Trojan or some other bug or Know, viral marketing is it you know lay persons uh, probably thinking of covid uh, you know if it's a port you know what port is it a database uh, a firewall port ftp etc so this is you know 
every word can mean completely different thing. Is it HDMI port? Is it USB port? USB C port? Or is it a you know shipping port or something else? So as as you are already, I mean, as I'm already seeing the responses, you know, we all have different uh, imaginations of the same word. So if this is a challenge for even a single word, then what happens uh, in in a sentence? You know, when there is more data, not just one word, but there are several data coming off from various sources. So uh, again, sandbox. Uh, I'm happy somebody thought of a play area with a you know scoop or something. So you know, basically that's you know it's very different. So I want to you know, introduce you to another uh, uh, you know, rather uh, storyline wherein here it's not just one word, but a set of words, rather phrases, and a story is developing, uh, and, and the phrases are present, presented as the story is developing. This is you know, this is how in a business, in a cybersecurity world, it works. But, you, know, you have to figure out something as something is going on already. You know, that is how you know, usually blue teams, and you know, uh, especially on the defending side, people have to work. Because something is, you know, the, 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 there is some activity going on, and you have to figure out what exactly that means in a given context as the activity is going on. So I'm just giving one, one example. It is nothing to do with cybersecurity on the you know, story one side. The thunder was deafening and it started pouring. You know, set of words and the context. As the storm intensified, roads flooded and the residents sought refuge from the pounding rain. It was a much needed relief as the rain final, finally dosed the raging wildfire, saving homes and lives. So, the story completely changed only with the last you know, phrase because that's when everything made sense. Until then, probably you were imagining something else. So this is how the story can change even with a, a bit of different data with a different context. So how about a story for a cybersecurity? The firewall says, saw, saw increase in failed user logins. The server was overloaded and the IT team scrambled to figure out what was going wrong. Thanks to the self you know, inflicted attack, rather you know, simulation, uh, a IAM misconfiguration was identified and quickly fixed. This is also very important. You know, uh, For a blue teamer, I know there are people who are not necessarily cybersecurity experts, but blue teamer are pe people who defend and red teamers who, who are usually attack, you know, people who attack. So for a, for a red teamer to be successful, all he needs is just one vulnerability, one misconfiguration. So out of 100%, you know, if he gets 1%, then he's successful. But for a blue teamer, uh, he has to be 99% perfect. You know, even, sorry, 100% perfect. Even 99% is not sufficient because 1% is all it takes to be exploited. So it is by, by self-inflicting these drills, that is when we can keep hardening our you know, blue team at the, of, the, of the story. This is just an example to emphasize how context and data uh, are interrelated and how everything can change. The insights can change depending on the flow of the story and the data. So we are still delving on you know, wide knowledge graphs. If there is a data abundance, that is not a problem. You know, we can still address needle in a haystack problem. Often in cybersecurity world, technologies and data are fragmented across all the layers, across various teams, etc. So disconnected data is a huge challenge because we miss the big picture. So this is where knowledge graph can help us by providing the panoramic overview of all the activities as it is happening. And the blind spot is the major challenge. Like, you know, I can't protect something that I don't know I need to protect. You now, what I mean by that is like, you know, all the, of all the knowledge, uh, it can be broadly categorized into three parts. Like I know what I know. For example, I know there is a path. I know there is a firewall. I, I know I work for this company. Yeah, no, I know about all these things about my company. But then there are some things that I, I know that I don't know. The second category, wherein I know I can't fly a plane. You know, I'm not a pilot. But then there is third thing, which I don't know what I don't know. Like, you know, I, I for example, in the story, uh, the, the, the team never knew that there was a misconfiguration on the IAM side until there was some exercise. So, so this is where, you know, knowledge graphs can also help us discover uh, and elucidate some of the gaps in our own security apparatus. So the, you know, these are the three broad categories where knowledge graphs can help, and that is why we need knowledge graphs. And then going to the third part of my story, how? So how do we go from data, build a context, and do inference of this data with the context to 
get insights. So this is the third part of my you know, story. And hopefully I'll spend more time here. So to build a knowledge graph, you need three important um, pieces. One is ontology, another is inference engine, and obviously the third is data. So data, I have already you know, spoken about data for some time already. So I will rather concentrate on the ontology part, which is the most important part probably. Ontology is basically a, a frame or a rather a framework to, uh, to define what is linguistically agreeable to define a particular kind of data. It's just a, you know, it's just a framework, rather a language uh, to say, uh, what do we mean when I say something as something like, just like the way we ex explained uh, elephant. So if, if I were to define an ontology framework for elephant, the ontology will be constant across all these three categories that I had, like, you know, cybersecurity, businessman, et cetera. But if it is virus, the ontology uh, framework will differ, it will be different, different depending on whether it is a lay person or a biomedical engineer, uh, and then if it is a cybersecurity expert. So the way we define data and the words linguistically uh, has to be set. And that is where, uh, that, that's the field of ontology. That's what is ontology. An inference engine is you know, very generically speaking, it's set of rules. Like, uh, uh, the, the rules that you define as to what is right, what is wrong. If A is equal to B, B is equal to C, then A, A is equal to C, you know, these kind of inferences. Again, I'm not even speaking about the uh, inferences that you generate out of machine learning. I've kept it completely out of today's talk. So these three are the most important things that you need and uh, you know, that, that's, that's how you start building knowledge graphs. So people who have probably done some Google uh, search on this, you might have seen several meanings, several different kinds of uh, explanation for uh, knowledge graphs, have several examples. So I want to uh, spend a few minutes on de-jargonizing this. So one of the common representations of data uh, in, 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 a, in a connected fashion can be done using something called uh, labeled property graphs. It's a graph database and one of the most commonly widely familiar uh, databases out there is Neo4j. So this is one representation of uh, data where everything is connected to something else. But then this is a, technically speaking, it's a labeled property graph, wherein the representation is nodes and edges. Both nodes and edges can have attributes, properties defined. And the schema can be flexible. It can be entirely dependent on you know, how you define your, your particular problem that you want. Uh, and if it is for Neo4j, then there is Cypher, but there are other you know, various other uh, technologies uh, for which there will be Gremlin, AQL, blah, blah, blah. So, so there are various ways of querying this data represented in this fashion. And you know, inference is generally not intuitively built into the database itself or the data representation itself. Usually inference is done outside of this representation using uh, you know, uh, graph algorithms and so on and so forth. And it is you know, useful in building context because you, know, you have full flexibility. That's one way of uh, representing data in an interconnected fashion. But then the most appropriate way of calling something knowledge graph is actually RDF knowledge graphs. So this is the, you know, this is the technically right way of representing uh, or calling something as knowledge graphs. Wherein the, the data is stored as a, a triples, RDF triples. Something is subject, subject predicate, and you know, object. And uh, some of the most common you know, uh, such uh, representations are DBpedia, where entire Wikipedia has been stored and so on and so forth. But here, they, you know, it, it follows a very strict ontology. There is a strict ontological dependency. It, it, it has to cater and adhere to the framework defined by a particular ontology. Generally, yes, yes, SparkQL is a language which is used to retrieve data. And automated inference is possible. You know, it's pretty well done here. And as well as context building is also good. But today I want to discuss neither of this, but one, one other thing is called, you know, I, I am calling it as knowledge reasoning, you know, knowledge representation and reasoning, wherein the data is not represented uh, you know, in either ways, but it's slightly more advanced way, which is uh, the data is represented as graphs, which automatically means it has nodes and edges as well, but it's also has the ability to represent data in hypergraphs. And this also has a strict adherence to ontology, whatever you define as part of the data representation. And, and the query language for the technology that I'm using, uh, we use uh, IQL. 
automated inference is probably the biggest strength of this uh, way of representing data. And context building is also completely you know, uh, dependent on the ontology and the kind of data you have. So this is, you know, these are the three kinds. And probably for today, I will be only you know, sticking to this, this particular kind of uh, you know, representation. Oh, OK. Uh, oops, OK. I want to know, you know, I want to know a little bit about again uh, the audience. Are you familiar with sticks or mitre? You know, if you are an expert, then you know you probably you are contributing to it. Or if you are somewhat familiar, you know you are here. If you have no clue, then you know you probably ask who is mitre. I'll just wait for a, a couple of seconds for you to submit your uh, polls. Okay, there are some people who are also you know new to this. Thing. Okay, that's fine. So in the interest of time, I will just you know skip. Uh, uh, okay, there are more people here. That's okay. But I will you know I will take it uh, you know take it along, uh, all of us. So I'll come back to this you know knowledge graph uh, on how we build in this specific category in the specific uh, demo that I'm going to give. For ontology, I'm using sticks. For inference engine, I'm using the technology called TypeDB. And for data, it is from MITRE ATT&CK. I will, I will explain each of this in a second. So TypeDB is a, is a database as well as inference engine. Uh, it, is, it has an expressive schema, very expressive schema. What it means is it has entities, attributes, relationships that you can build. It, it, uh, it, uh, it has very strict adherence to data integrity and consistency. Uh, there is no scope for uh, any deviation here. And it, it, it does rule-based inferencing. You know, it can do both logical and inheritance-based inferencing. It's basically defined on how you define data, and which is already generally encoded as part of the ontology that you define. Like, you know, for example, if I'm just taking an example, I'm, you know, I'm using a table. So the table is defined as something that stands on ground and uh, you know, uh, and the laptop is on table. So I'm just defining that, you know, if if uh, if I'm giving this talk and I'm using laptop, it automatically implies that uh, the table is on the ground and uh, the laptop is on the table. So it, 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 that is how linguistically you are uh, you know, defining some rule as part of the ontology itself. So that, that is very well done here, uh, both logical and inheritance. It has both nested and hypergraphs. So this is one example of hypergraph wherein you, know, you are connecting not just two, you know, generally in a graph, there is two uh, you know, nodes and one edge. But here it's, it's slightly more complicated, wherein you know, more advanced, I would say, like you know, you have source, traffic, and payload. All of this contributes to this one entity, which is network traffic source. And the language that we use here is TypeQL. It's a high-level uh, expressive language. The second part of that circle is you know, Stix object. Stix uh, is a community-driven uh, ontology project from OSS. It's one of the most beautiful, uh, thorough ontologies that I've come across. I'm Really excited to learn this. I'm, you know, uh, I'm falling in love with sticks definitions. Uh, every time I, I I understand more and more about it. Somebody, I mean, I'm not just one person. I'm sure there are several people who have spent years building this thoroughly. Uh, and this is how it is represented uh, in this specific knowledge graph. You know, you have a stick object, then there are core, there are meta objects, and so on and so forth, like campaign attack patterns course of action that you need to take to mitigate an attack pattern. All these things are represented in this fashion. This is how the inference engine and the nested loops will work uh, you know, in, in an ontological way. This is basically a representation of sticks. If, if people who are familiar with sticks might probably understand this very quickly. And these are some of the jargons from sticks. Again, I will just skip over uh, and spend more time on the demo than here. And the third circle is basically the data. In this case, the data is coming from MITRE. So this, this data you know, is basically a database of various attacks, tactics, and techniques uh, of all the most uh, well-known uh, reported uh, attacks that have happened in the past. And it is also community driven and you know, continuously updated. And it is very widely used and adapted by various companies, including us, as well as uh, you know several other uh, solution providers, industries, service industries, etc. And I want to take one example of this. Mitre has lots and lots of uh, groups uh, of attackers, but I want to just take one example where is uh, 
Lazarus group. It's also called APT38, Hidden Cobra, etc. It's a state-sponsored uh, uh, cyber hacker group active since 2009. And um, some of the most notable attacks from this group was Sony Pictures, a bank haste, as well as a very recent WannaCry ransomware. So using this data, I will give this demo. As I mentioned earlier, all these things are publicly available. I have posted the you know, links also. It's all open source. You will be able to do it in the next half an hour after this talk. So nothing to worry. I have intentionally you know, put it small uh, so that I can just copy paste it quickly. So going to the demo, I want to, you know, I have taken just three examples in the demo. And the intention is to emphasize the unique capabilities of this knowledge graph, not to just show everything that is you know, possible in some other fashion. So what I want to show here is the visual representation of the complexity involved. And that is answered by this question, you know, uh, which is attack pattern of a particular group. And the second is, you know, I'm, I'm, you know this question requires the engine to do two things, which is it has to identify pattern matching and then do inferencing. And I'll come to the third one in a second. So I'll just you know, come out of this uh, thing and uh, go to the demo. So this is, this is just the workspace uh, for running this engine. I'm running it on my laptop, which is not uh, you know, extraordinarily powerful or anything, which, which basically, basically means that you can run it on any laptop, even five, six years old laptops. So I want to just copy from, from here the code to show you how the data would look for this particular thing. So how do I, yeah. So it is running this, the engine is running. And basically what it is showing is a visual, visual representation of all the malwares and the attack patterns that this particular group uses. And this is the visual representation. It's still loading. So you can see this data on MITRE database as well. So it, it'll be just a text, you know, regular text kind of data. But this is, you know, uh, uh, the, I want to show the emphasis. Uh, I want to emphasize on the connectedness. I'll just take some, you know, I'll zoom out to show you the overview uh, and then probably dive in to probably look at this particular you know, uh, group, whatever is happening there. I am assuming this is an attack pattern or a malware. Yes, it's an attack pattern. So, you know, there's there an attack pattern which uses a lot of tactics. I'm just tracking one of these things. And what is this? Uh, it is, it's a malware. Yeah, it's a, it's a malware. And, but that malware is also used in another, uh, by another attack pattern. And this attack pattern is what? It's a, it's a clear window event logs. It's, it's a, type of attack pattern. So you can, in this way, you can see the same you know, malware is used by two different attack patterns. You know, you can see the interconnectedness between uh, attack patterns, tactics, techniques, and so on and so forth. So that, that is the you know, overview of uh, and the intention of this particular example. I'll just go to the you know, second example. I'll clear this. If not, my browser might uh, complain. Going to the second one. Here, what the intention is to, you know, to do two things. First of all, to answer this question, which is what attack patterns are used by the malwares that were used by some other thing also. So we have to identify what are the patterns for APT and then look at all the patterns by all the malwares. So here I'm going and pasting it. And here is the response. So this is a subset of two pattern matchings that's happened uh, you know, in the background. I'll just take one example. So I'm, I'm not the right person to describe what exactly this means, you know, in, in cybersecurity uh, jargons, but I'm just seeing that, you know, looking at the connectedness, you know, this is, this is how things are connected to each other. And, you know, these are the, some of the malwares that are commonly used uh, across you know, uh, different kinds of uh, you know, groups. And this is you know, attack pattern. And, uh, you know, this attack pattern is system information discovery. So the intention of showing this is, I mean, obviously this is, you know, uh, this is a language you can write it in whatever way you want to. So if I can do it for one, you know, one particular group, you can imagine that you can do it for any, any group that is there on the MITRE database and this database, you know, this data uh, that, that is, that you are seeing, the database already has all the data that is there on the MITRE. So you, you can basically try it for, you know, if, if not 38, I can just try for 28 and see what it has to offer. 
and I'm assuming the pattern will be different. Yeah, so this is for 28. So I don't know what 28 is, by the way, uh, but you know, it's, it is different. So in this way, you can, you know, uh, I, I mean, intentionally, I mean, I'm not, in, you know, uh, I'm showing this all uh, visually to you know, uh, rather explain this uh, in an in a, in a idea centric manner. Obviously, this can be programmatically done, which, which is a lot more efficient. So I will just close this and come to the third uh, example that I had. So I will probably spend a couple of uh, minutes here. So the third example is I'm asking a, uh, I'm basically asking a question, what is the uh, course of mitigation in this case, you know, uh, restrict file directory and permissions. And will this course of mitigation, course of action, mitigate the problems associated uh, with the APT, uh, APT 38 you know, uh, intrusion set. So it's basically, I'm trying to understand, will one of the course of mitigations that I'm about to take make any sense in protecting myself from this particular group? So here you will see uh, you know, multi-level nested inference happening. So here you go. So I'll, I will, you know, I will delve a little bit here. Let me keep this intrusion set separately. So here we have intrusion set APT38. And uh, this is the course of action. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in one of the inf inferred paths, it is saying that to mitigate APT38, the course of action which is restrict file and directory permissions are valid. So this is one particular mitigation that it has suggested. But then there is also another path which also is suggesting something. Let me delve on just one of these. So this diamond actually already means, as the name it says, that it is inferred mitigation. So it is inferring based on some of the preconditions that we have defined as part of the sticks data frame. If I double click it, which I just did, it is telling me why it thinks this is the right way forward. Because it says that there is an attack pattern called indicator removal on host. And that attack pattern can be mitigated by this particular course of action. And that attack pattern is actually used by this intrusion set. That is how, you know, that is how uh, uh, this is inferred, but that's not the uh, only thing. There is one more, I'll just move it away and then take it forward. So there is, there is one more attack pattern, which also can be mitigated by same course of action, because that attack pattern is also used by the same intrusion set. And this attack pattern is, you know, data destruction. That also is an attack pattern, and that also is, you know, uh, uh, hence it is inferred. But again, that's not uh, alone either. There is more. You can see how it is developing. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm assuming uh, you are able to, you know, uh, you know uh, understand the complexity uh, involved. But then the automatic inference engine is working beautifully to infer from these things, just like the way humans would do. Like, you know, if A is equal to B, B is equal to C, then you know it has to be this. But this is a lot more complex because of the, uh, the, the way the nature of the sticks objects are defined and the data is presented. So this is another the service stop also. Like, you know, this is, this is you know, I'm sure, okay, this is end. This is just one, one course of action. The, you know, this, while well, it said this is used, that also was inferred. So this is, you saw one level of abstraction, which is an aggregation of three inference, but then, one of that inference is also inferred because you know there is something else here. So there is you know, that attack pattern can also be exploited by another malware, which is also used by this intrusion set. And that, that malware is called kill desk. Similarly, even this one has another malware which happens to use the same kill desk. And I don't know what it, this has to say. That also is using the same malware. I mean, in this particular case, they are uh, all these three 
uh, you know, in, inferred paths are all using the same malware, but it can be different if I start with something else, like, you know, I mean, I can explore 28 and see what it has to say. So let's see what 28 has to, you know, uh, APT 28 has to offer. So this also has you know, uh, inferred mitigation. Let me put it somewhere here. Uh, this is the, you know, this is the intrusion set. I'll just pull it aside here. Uh, and then, you know, you have course of action and the course of action is the same. Again, there are so many, you know, hundreds of course of action. I'm just taking one of them uh, for the demo purposes. Uh, and then, you know, you have this intrusion set, which is, you know, APT 28. It's not uh, Lazarus group anymore. It's a different group. And now this is inferred. So I want to know what, why is it inferring like this? Let me double click it, which I did. So this is a different attack pattern used by this particular group and hence the inference. And this is called masquerading. It's an attack, you know, uh, pattern that, that it is used. I'm, 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 I'm probably thinking this one more. Yeah, yes, there will be probably one more here. So there's an, one other attack pattern that is used, which is, uh, I think, credentials in files. That also uh, is an attack pattern and which uh, that course of, you know, this particular course of action will mitigate this attack pattern as well. There is one more, okay, you know, you, it can go on. Obviously, you know, you can do this programmatically more, more efficiently, but as I said, I wanted to convey the idea more than just uh, some tools and, uh, you know, uh, techniques. So here there is you know, clear Windows log event. That attack pattern can also be mitigated by this course of action, which is restrict file permissions and you know, directory permissions. So this is, you know, I'm just exploring this for one particular course of action. And I showed you just two groups. Now you can imagine there are like hundreds, probably hundreds of uh, ways of exploring this because it's like, you know, N versus N. Uh, you know, uh, NPN co you know, combination kind of, uh, 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 you know, options that are available. You can, you know, this is a graphical representation, but you can be essentially see this in a JSON format as well, which, you know, it can be extracted using a uh, Stix uh, Python library. There is a Python library that can be used to extract this information as a JSON object to, you know, work uh, with it in the, in, the, in the future. So this is, you know, this is basically what I wanted to show in the demo. The, the purpose of this demo was to show the most important, rather unique capabilities of representing uh, knowledge graphs for MITRE database. So here, there are several, you know, I have already constrained this demo to a very tight corner. First of all, I'm only looking at one data, set of data, which is MITRE database. And within that MITRE database, I'm only looking at two examples, uh, probably one which I showed two examples and uh, two ways of mitigation. Now you can think there are hundreds of mitigations and attack groups within MITRE. And then if you can you know, think of other databases like CV database and various other databases, then your ability to you know, cross talk between all these databases increases tremendously. And this is still a static data. Like, you know, it is not changing as I'm working with it. Now imagine you are also ingesting network logs and various other logs, which adhere to sticks domain, you know, ontological domain. And then you can imagine that you, you know you can do all these querying constantly and try to understand the story as it is developing. I'm just going back to the example that I you know initially said uh, about uh, you know uh, the thunderstorm and etc. So in this way, even within just cybersecurity by Consuming data coming off from various layers, like seven layers, you can get a huge, tremendous, uh, you know, uh, big picture of all the activities. But that's not yet either. Usually, what is missing is we often miss, at least in the businesses that I have you know, worked with, we miss the business context. So, is this attack group specializing in attacking banks, or are they specializing in attacking uh, supply chain? Or are they geographically you know, uh, restricted and active in a specific uh, you know, geography? So these kind of data can also be ingested. So you know this there is there is no dearth of imagination here, and it's only the beginning. So I will just leave you uh, uh, leave the demo here at this stage and let you imagine the potential of you know, having this. By the way, you know uh, even other uh, I know there are some experts like you know there are uh, MISP and various other. Uh, open repositories and platforms that are available to do threat hunting. They also give data in sticks format, which means 
anything that is in sticks formats can be directly consumed here and you, know, you could use it you could potentially use it for doing any kind of analysis that is threat hunting forensics blue team activities anything so as long as the data is you know uh, sticks defined you can consume it here so in the summary i will again for the sake of idea summary is very simple there is only one message knowledge graphs provide context that's all so without context uh, no machine learning can do you know great job of course we have you no know, machine learners which are doing uh, data things you know etc etc but they are all usually uh, very narrowed and you know very specific uh, but the more and more data you provide the more and more uh, uh, context that you build you get the you know insights out of uh, the data very well for those who are interested to pursue this further you know here are some here are some you know, further uh, learnings so the, the technology that i'm using is type db everything as i said everything that is there uh, is open source there are these two are the tutorials that you can follow uh, and uh, you know i have been you know familiar with this particular database for 3 years now previously it was called graken and now it's called uh, type db so it's it's fantastic uh, it it does things that uh, you know basically i had challenges working with various other databases and all the challenges that i had uh, was addressed addressed here and i have been using for example neo4j for the last uh, 12 years so this is the python library for for you to you know work with the sticks data uh, and specifically for uh, the linguistic people coming from uh, uh, you know that kind of background who are interested in that part of the story uh, i strongly suggest uh, this particular uh, youtube series it's fantastic it's very very helpful that uh, i have been i've been actually listening to it for the second time there are 72 videos uh, from dr harald and uh, he takes you through various things and one of the key things uh, that i did not cover today is ontological engineering which uh, will be essential at some point and by this you know i just want to uh, thank a few people first of all organizers you now thank you prakash nirup and the, and the entire team at the uh, you know university of north dakota uh, and uh, i have actually listened to some of the videos and the uh, talks from this series as well particularly i liked uh, giovanni's and uh, samuel's talks it was fantastic i completely you know enjoyed it and uh, i could relate to giovanni's uh, uh, scientific research findings wherein he said usually the cost is often missing uh, when you analyze any kind of research uh, purely in academic setting uh, the biggest picture is that that is often missing is the cost Uh, associated with any attack or any you know any anything so that is one of the things that he was explaining as part of his uh, you know uh, uh, talk and i could relate to it immediately and samuel i mean uh, he is like you know I, he just reminded me of uh, uh, you know oh god how, how can i forget it from the lord of the rings that character uh, i forgot yeah basically all learned and uh, you know a highly learned person with uh, years of experience so the, uh, that also i completely enjoyed and learned a great deal uh do, do you can you recollect the name of that uh, beard person niru i'm not referring to gimli are you sorry you're not referring to gimli are you uh, the wizard oh um i think somebody in the chat might be able to assist yeah here we go gandalf i think they probably know yeah, more than me too so <laughs> you love god yeah come on yeah sometimes you yeah yeah <laughs> yes obviously yeah kind of you know, i i i strongly suggest everybody is to see this he gives a completely different perspective uh, of what again the definition of cyber security has changed over many years and i am seeing it changing almost you know every month like you know the time the kinds of activities that's going on uh, so he gives a fantastic uh, you know historical perspective of what it means to be a cyber security expert in like 20 years back to now and uh, you know uh, these people are you know at the forefront of developing uh, the technology that i'm using srujan uh, is a professor in texas uh, who who specializes in ai and cyber security uh, thomas uh, he is the ceo of this particular technology and uh, uh, he has done extraordinary work in various other fields as well as this and brett has been helping me you know uh, I, i don't know him personally and I, i don't know anybody here here personally i'm not you know uh, you know selling anybody uh, anything but brett has been you know i have been chatting it, with him uh, for several days uh, and he has been helping me a lot to understand and uh, move forward and uh, he has been telling me that what i showed now 
uh, even even though it was very brief is just the beginning they already have several beta versions that are capable of doing a lot more things than what i showed uh, and he wanted me to tell this to the forum that uh, within three months time there will be a lot more that they could offer and all of this will be open source you know? uh, as i said i'm a big open source for fan and these people are also and you know my own uh, you know, uh, family pinnacle rangan uh, Basically, Rangan is the CEO and he is a serial entrepreneur. He has done amazing things, uh, and he helped me discover myself and my potential. So I am extremely thankful to him. And uh, there are several people who are either already working with me or you no know, about to work with me, with me or worked and now moved on to other things. And this is the entire team. There are more people, and obviously all the attendees here. As I said, I really want your feedback, and I always build on the feedback, and. Uh, feedback is the most important part for me in every talk so please provide this and this you know for security reasons uh, uh, i will not be keeping it open it will be only alive the link will be only alive for one hour so if there are any questions i'll be happy to take i think i am spot on time thank you perfect thank you dr hati i think it was a very informative talk um while we wait for questions i do have a couple of questions on my own as well so we've heard of this thing called open source intelligence like something that you mentioned earlier in the talk was we have more data than we need right so um when you look at applications like uh, threat intelligence uh could you provide some examples of some applications that you worked on that leveraged maybe threat intelligence techniques or open source intelligence uh i cannot comment on the open source yet because this is the only open source that i'm currently using specifically for cyber security but i you know uh, i am familiar with the uh, sophos and uh, uh, azure sentinel so we have been using azure sentinel and sophos uh, for some time now but because they are not open source i i think uh, you know it will not address the question uh, you know in the right way yeah but msp is something that you know we have just started understanding and you know, specifically to integrate this with a few other things yeah right right one of the applications that i could think of was like uh, uh when banks actually uh, they have this monitoring database like if they they monitor the, the dark web actually if any credit card information is lost or uh, if there's some bank account information that is uh, leaked you know they monitor the dark web for this kind of information something that just came to mind i guess as you were mentioning that um <clears throat> Yes, I do have another question. Um, since our audience actually consists of students, uh, what are some open research areas when it comes to knowledge crafts that you can point these students to 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 actually explore more? Oh, there is there is so much to do. There's literally there is so much to do. So, for example, in in my own case, when I you know the day I started uh, working for this company, I started exploring knowledge craft. I mean that that is why I joined this company. so uh, i spent a great deal of time understanding uh, with my team there are a uh, few other people who actually helped me with this understanding various ontologies we still couldn't figure out what exactly to use and every time you know for example we used a uh, 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 unified cyber ontology if i'm correct ucvo is one ontology then there is this and there are few other specific ontologies for uh, representing it infrastructure etc etc so uh, generally speaking ontology is still very much in development according to me because there is nothing right or wrong about it it all depends on what lens are you looking at even we have you know looked at examples where the same content the same data can mean slightly differently between red teamer and a blue teamer because you know we are looking at it from slightly different angles so the ontology needs a great deal of effort and people with you know linguistic and uh, uh, graph background uh, can just dive into it there is so much more to do here and most of it is anyway open source i mean it is not possible to develop ontologies uh, you know, for a, for any you know any enterprise or uh, you know individual i i don't think it is viable so that is one area i can see uh, a great potential so i mean uh, i can go on but that's one you know area that i found is the biggest gap but other than that you no know, uh, somebody who already has knowledge graph sorry uh, a, a background a strong background in uh, uh, you know uh, Cyber security can understand sticks and then start writing uh, libraries. For example, you know the sticks is uh, you know sticks to Python library is being uh, written by Brett and uh, Surjan. 
so they can contribute to that project so one of the areas that uh, needs attention is how can we uh, you know port some of the graph specific algorithms uh, and build use cases and examples for cybersecurity there are several graph algorithms uh, and uh, it's not very easy to as of now it's not very easy to port it so that that is you know somebody who is familiar with uh, both sticks and uh, this can do a lot of work there there is yeah that is two areas that i can think of immediately great thank you dr hati so we do have one more question um what are the ethical considerations excuse me that need to be taken into account when implementing knowledge graphs in cybersecurity yeah ethics is a very important thing uh i'm a i'm a you know big fan of ethics so one thing i would say is for you know uh it, you know by you know especially for companies you know it, you know uh, i i see this uh, as a challenge for you know any company how how can you protect yourself as a cyber security company is first of all a big challenge and it will have ethical implications because you know you know it's it's like a, a police officer being robbed okay so if something happens to a cyber security company then you you just lose trust in police so trust is a big thing and directly related to ethics as well so how how uh, strong are you in you know uh, making you know sure that you are on top of the game is a big challenge and as part of the challenge you know we have to ensure ethics is taken at, at, the, at the greatest level possible because you know we are dealing with uh, i mean i see this no different between you know biomedical uh, data as well you know uh, whenever you use you know handle biomedical data you have to be extremely careful about uh, you know patients confidentiality and so on and so forth and similarly here you know a cyber security company you are basically sitting with uh, a diagnostic report uh, which says all the problems of a different company so ethically how do you protect it how do you ensure this is protected at the topest level how do you ensure you implement uh, you know process processes technology and train our own internal people uh, to to take care of this at the highest uh, ethical level possible is one of the biggest challenges uh, and and, uh, and a constant journey that everybody has to go through that that is one thing because as i said everything that is on the open source is a, is a fair play you know generally is fine uh, but once you want to integrate this with something real world that's where is the biggest challenge and i mean as i said you know we are working on this like you know, we are exploring various other ontologies to understand and represent our own clinical you know uh, 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 client data you know for example you know, using uh, you know, dbpedia schema.org and various other things and understand you know we are we are we are basically building several layers so that the 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 uh, the open source layer and the you know, uh, confidential layer actually do not know each other's data at all it's yeah, it's all you know, it's all taken in a way where uh, the inferences is done but without uh, revealing anything to each other it's like you know we are trying to get, get insights without actually revealing or uh, you know exploring anything which is uh, uh, you know sensitive so that's that's a big challenge perfect okay so um another question what are the key challenges in building and maintaining a knowledge graph for cyber security i think you mentioned a little bit of this earlier in the talk but could you elaborate maybe a little bit more on this yes yes yeah I, that's the, yeah that's a it's a journey okay so i can i can tell you in my in my i can basically share my own journey uh, so as i said i started off with neo4j as an example again uh, I, i am a big fan of neo4j i am a developer uh, you know certified developer and what not but uh, when i started off you know, as graph databases it gives immediate you know uh, value in in days you know very very quick but when it comes to maintaining you will hit a you know a uh, you know, uh, roof or, or a ceiling which you cannot break because the data is always evolving that the context is always changing and it is not possible to have a la labeled graph i mean uh, it's nothing against neo4j there are so many other uh, uh, you know technologies in that space but generally anywhere you are building knowledge graph with a property labeled property graph will hit a roof ceiling you which you will not be able to break but if you are looking for a quick win that's the right way forward because that is where you will basically wet your hands and try to understand the concepts and you know uh, so on and so forth for quick wins that's the right way forward but 
uh, maintaining will become a challenge sooner or later. The second problem with that is inferencing because you know, label property graph uh, inherently has some inference, but most of the inference should be done outside of the data model using various Python libraries. So that will also hit a you know, wall at some point. You, know, you, you will not be able to do all the kinds of inferencing and it, it's, a, it's a technically challenging project you know, for, you know, for, for an entire team. That's one category. But if you are coming to actual technical knowledge graphs, which is RDF property graphs, that has a very steep learning curve. So, as I said, you know, we are exploring. I mean, we have already rep represented our own internal data as you know uh, business data as schema you know, according to schema.org and uh, DBpedia and few other uh, you know uh, ontologies. But everything has a challenge and everything has a same limitation, and there is a lot of ontological engineering that has to be done. And RDF also has uh, you know where it is you know, perfect in many ways also has some of these challenges you know there, there might be cases where it is you know uh, you will have to uh, you, know, you will not be able to understand whether the inference is uh, sound or not so there are you know there are few challenges that will be there also so that is where you know i, I took the path that i just showed you wherein you know, uh, it is neither too hard to start off or too easy to start but then you will hit a wall at some point but there is something in between, uh, which is what I felt uh, we should explore. I mean, we have tried both, and that is when you know the. I mean, I'm just showing you what I felt was worth showing. So I didn't show the other two, but yeah. The, so the, the, that's, you know, that's, that's the middle path is uh, you know is fairly uh, both quick wins, and as well as uh, maintenance will not be too hard if you stick to you know one or two well-defined ontologies. Um, I have a question, Kaushik. Uh, thank you again for your uh, presentation today. So, so from uh, your company perspective, you know, what is your, um, you know, what is your company is you know, looking at from strategic, uh, you know, talking to your own clients. Who are your clients that you are actually dealing with, and what are you, what is your uh, company's goal in actually, you know, in in using these open source software? But I'm just curious to see what you are hearing from your clients in terms of uh, you know there are a lot of uh, uh, networks where you know there are a lot of legacy systems moving them to cloud or hybrid cloud or maybe on premise you know so i'm just trying to see how do you get the reception of uh, you know either knowledge graph or machine learning from uh, i'm just curious to see what is your company's hearing from uh, your clients Okay, <laughs> I mean that should be another session in itself. <laughs> so, yeah. but I'm, I'm trying to summarize it anyway. So, the, you know, the reason why I asked is actually because you know we're all this is research challenges. You know, when we talk about any infrastructure networks, you want to do a scalable framework. We're moving into a cloud, but there is a hesitancy in terms of depending on which. Uh, and industrial companies that you talk to to actually to help them to to make them realize to see moving from you that you call from uh, what to call data rich to insight rich right and you everybody wants that insight rich but they're not willing to make that investment or or not willing to even open for because of x and y regulation other things that's going on depending on compliance issue but uh, so that is the reason why I asked for because we have a lot of students who are looking at a compliance and, and research as well. So, yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, by the way, you know, uh, data data rich to insight rich is the quote of my CEO Rangan. So I just want to you know uh, attribute that as well. So uh, which which <laughs> is fantastic, by the way. So see, according to IC three report, I'm assuming you you are familiar with IC three that the the open uh, government organization which tracks cyber crime. So according to that report, 70% of all cyber crimes are because of human error. And I think you see the challenge already. It's because of us humans. So there, again, when I say us humans, there are again several layers of it. There are, you know, most often as part of our clients, what we have seen or rather observed is, you know, you don't wake up until you are punched in the face. Okay. So, as, as I said, you know, for a, for a hacker, all he needs is some intern in the in the ten thousand strong force organization to click a spam email. That's all it takes. So for a for a you know red teamer or a hacker, 
it's very easy to start but for an organization which is you know even not not necessarily thousands but hundreds everybody has to be on the top notch so human you know, human awareness is a big deal so this is where we are actually working a lot with some of our customers and it is it is a, again it's a journey especially with you know generative ai uh, and all these things most of our current algorithms to detect phishing will be unsuccessful you know they will basically you know be useless because uh, you know the, the the algorithms to detect phishing is primarily built on you know behavioral analysis and spelling errors and what not all that can be easily overcome by you know generative ai like uh, or chat gpt and so on and so forth so we have to completely you know, we have to change the game completely so the human challenge is one of the major things and the second is not necessarily technology you know you even even some of our clients have all kinds of uh, you know solutions and products across all the layers but integration so this is where we have, they have lot of data they just don't know how to look at it because when well, they are looking at one particular microscope there is something else is already changing which means the relevance of this microscopic data is changed so how do you look at something where well, the story is actually happening so this is where we are also you know building solutions and product to help our company or various other companies Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for that insight. Even if you get uh, punched in the face, some companies are not willing to look at the cost. Right, cost is a big factor. You know, does it really make sense for me to invest this resource to really to? It's okay to compromise this and this, but you know, I think what cost? Right, so cost always plays into a role when we look at uh, cybersecurity solutions. You know, anyway, it's so interesting. I really enjoyed your interactive presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And with this, we're going to conclude. Nirup, do you have any other questions do you see? Or uh, um, are we okay to conclude? Yeah, there is one more question. Uh, but I think probably in the interest of time, it might be better to, to conclude the session. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaushik. We will be sending you uh, our your plague, a plaque for um, uh, your token of appreciation for your time and effort. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to working with you as we you know find some more opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you for it, everybody. Yeah, thank you.